here's near where I need to make a little confession. I have been agonizing over how to introduce Marilyn Hacker to you today. The cliche is in this instance apt. Words cannot express what she and her work have meant to me. I was extremely lucky to have taken a course in women's poetry with Marilyn Hacker when I was at the Graduate Center. In reality, however, Hacker was my teacher long before I ever sat in her classroom. Her poetry has been an integral part of my life as a reader, as an academic, and as a poet. Two of the chapters in my dissertation are anchored by poems by Marilyn Hacker. I have taught her poems to my students. I have presented conference papers on her work. And I have read and reread her poems just for the pleasure of what is on the page. Marilyn Hacker has an extraordinary poetic voice, clear and honest. Her work is in turn body, contemplative, joyful, sorrowful. As someone who at least occasionally writes in received form myself, I find her work exquisite. <coughs> Excuse me, exquisite. <coughs> Excuse me. Sonnets and pantoums and other forms are beautifully crafted in all the best meanings of the word craft, and the meter and rhymes never feel forced or unnatural. Marilyn Hacker's poetry is courageous and strong. This does not mean her poetic voice is never vulnerable or sad or doubting. What this does mean is that here is the voice of a survivor, of someone who has lived a life full of human emotion and experiences, some good, some bad, and continues to express those emotions and experiences in ways both beautiful and profound. I think perhaps this is one of the things I relate to most in Hacker's work. As some of you know, I grew up in Maine, and Maine women are known for their strength and resiliency and stubbornness. I have seen that strength firsthand in my family and in my friends. It is a strength that's best expressed by one of my mom's favorite sayings, it's a fine life if you don't weaken. <laughs> I see this same strength. See, you get it, right? I see this same strength, this same ability to endure, the same determination to not weaken, as well as the possibility of a fine life in Hacker's work. One of my very favorite Marilyn Hacker poems, April Interval, from Going Back to the River, ends with these lines. The life at my age will only be sweet as I make it. I can't guarantee myself a Boston marriage or more money, but I can be outdoors and on my feet as long as I'm still sound and it's still sunny. It is still sunny and Hacker is still definitely on her feet and we are extraordinarily lucky to have her here with us today. I am so very pleased and very proud to present to you Marilyn Hacker. Right, well, again, thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, I have just come back to New York after, well, well, well I live par a, a good deal of the time now uh, in, in France, in Paris, and when I'm not there, I'm here in New York, which is my, uh, my other home and my much older home. Uh, and it's really nice to be in New York at this time of year and in this place. Uh, and uh, I will start with a couple of more or less New York well, this is definitely a New York poem. It's called, um, even though the title Elysian Fields is, of course, a, a, also a reference to um, a boulevard in Paris, but it's not about Paris. Uh, is, is this too much in my face? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Elysian Fields. Champs-Élysées of Broadway says the awning of the cafe where Every Sunday morning, young lawyers in old jeans ripped at the knees do crosswords. Polyglot Lebanese run it. They've taken on two more shop fronts and run their, run their banner down all three at once. Four years ago, their sign, 
au petit beurre, was so discreet that meeting someone there, I'd tell her the street corner, not the name. They were in the right place at the right time. Meanwhile, the poor are trying hard enough. Outside on Broadway, people sell their stuff laid out on blankets, cardboard cartons, towels. A stout matron with lacquered auburn curls circles the Viridian throw rug and pla painted plaster San Martin to hug a thinner, darker woman who hugs her volubly back in Spanish, a neighbor, I guess, and guess they still have houses. The man with uncut brown French paperbacks, the man with two embroidered gypsy blouses and three pilled pitiful pairs of plaid slacks folded behind him on the, pave on the pavement where there was a Puerto Rican hardware store that's been a vacant shop front for three years may not. There's a young couple down the block from our corner. She's tall, gaunt, gangly, black. He's short, quick, voluble, unshaven, white. They set up shop dry mornings around eight. I've seen him slap her face, jerking her thin arm like a rag doll's, a dollar kept from him. She moves too slow, whore, stupid bitch. She's my wife he tells a passing man who stops and watches. If anyone did call the cops, it would, it would be to prevent them and their stacks of old vogues and outdated science texts, texts from blocking access to the upscale bar where college boys get bellicose on beer. Leave him, would I say? Does she have keys to an apartment, to a room? a door to close behind her? What we meant by poor when I was 20 was a tenement with clanking pipes and roaches. What we meant was up six flights of grimed, piss-pungent stairs, four babies, and a baby-faced welfare worker forbidden to say birth control. I was almost her on the payroll of New York State Employment Services the East 14th Street branch, whose job it was to send day workers, mostly black, to clean other people's houses. 5.15 and I walked east, walked south, walked up my own four flights. Poor was the neighbors, was next door, is still a door away. The door is mine. Outside the poor work Broadway in the rain, the cappuccino drinkers watch them pass under the awning from behind the glass. And uh, well, this is another New York, New York poem, and it's also a poem for another poet, as quite a, quite a few of them are. Uh, it's called Crepuscule with Muriel, and is in part a homage to the great American poet Muriel Rukeyser, and uh, the title is, of course, a tip, a tip of the hat to Thelonious Monk, um, Crepuscule with Nellie. Oh. Instead of a cup of tea, instead of a milk-silk whelk of a cup, of a cup of nearly six o'clock tea time, cup of a stumbling block, cup of an afternoon unredeemed by talk, cup of a cut brown loaf, of a slice, a lack of butter, blueberry jam that's almost black. Instead of tannin seeping into the cracks of a pot, the void of an hour seeps out, infects the slit of a cut I haven't the wit to fix with a surgeon's needle threaded with fine gauge silk as a key would thread the cylinder of a lock. But no key threads the cylinder of the lock. Late afternoon light, transitory, licks the place of the absent cup with its rough tongue, flicks itself out beneath the wheel's revolving spoke. Taut thoughts gone, with a blink of attention, slack, a vision of death and distance in the mix. She lost her words 
And how did she get them back when the corridor of a day was a lurching deck? The dream life, logic and codes and nervous ticks, she translated to a syntax which connects intense and unfashionable politics with morning coffee, Hudson sunsets, sex, then the short circuit of the final stroke, the end toward which all lines looped out, then broke. What a gaze out the window interjects on the southeast corner, a black lab box tugged as the light clicks green toward a late day walk by a plump brown girl in a purple anorak. The Bronx bound local comes rumbling up the tracks out of the tunnel over West Harlem blocks whose windows gleam on the animal warmth of bricks rouged by the fluvial light of six o'clock. And uh, this is dedicated in well, dedicated to the memory of, of the mem the, mem the memory of the great American poet Adrian Rich, who uh, who is still with us even though she is no longer with us, and it's called Pantoum in Wartime. <coughs> Were the mountain women sold as slaves in the city my friend has not written from for two weeks? One of the just has given back his medal. I wake up four times in the night soaked with sweat. In the city my friend has not written from, for two weeks there was almost enough electricity. I wake up four times in the night soaked with sweat and change my shirt and go to sleep again. There was almost enough electricity to heat water, make tea, bathe, write emails, and change her shirt and go to sleep again. Her mother has gallstones. Her sister mourns. Heat water, make tea, bathe, write emails to Mosul, London, New York, Beirut. Her sister mourns a teenage son who died in a stupid household accident. To Mosul, Havana, London, Beirut, I change the greeting, change the alphabet. War, like a stupid household accident, changes the optics of a scene forever. I change the greeting, change the alphabet, Hola, morning of light, ya compañera. Change the optics of a scene forever, present and always altogether elsewhere. Morning of roses, kiss you. Hasta luego to all our adolescent revolutions, present and always altogether elsewhere. It seemed as if something would change for good tomorrow. All our adolescent revolutions gone gray drink, drink exiles coffee if they're lucky. It seemed as if something would change for good tomorrow. She was our conscience and she died too early. The gray exiles drink coffee if they're lucky. Chaza's survivors sift through weeping rubble. She was our conscience, but she died too early, after she spoke of more than one disaster. Cursing, weeping, survivors sift through rubble. One of the just has given back his medal after he spoke of more than one disaster. How can we sing our songs if we are slaves? And this uh, is a newer poem that I, I think follows a bit on that one. It's one of those only the names have been changed. Uh, and um, this one takes place in Paris, not in New York. Or at least most of it does. <clears throat> and it's called Nieces and Nephews. In July, when, the, when Sahal was bombing Gaza, 
and we marched, and there were flags and brawls. Lamise waited for me on the corner, smiling in a lime green sleeveless dress, not her daily jeans. There were three cop cars parked in front of my building, and Lamise shouted giddily in Arabic, she's the terrorist here. I pinched her, shushed her, laughing, half those cops are Arabs. We went to a cafe, drank wine. She told me her niece had finally been freed from prison in Damascus. She lit up her cell phone to show me the 19-year-old girl's photo, the second of her older sister's children. Naima's Ismail on the corniche, sunlit in a rust corduroy jacket, white shirt open at the neck, smiles next to his aunt in paisley hijab and movie star dark glasses. Wind scuds the waves beyond. Out of Mosul for the first time in his life, she out of danger for the first time in six months. The last checkpoint, the last bakshish, the abaya shoved into a suitcase. A walk on Sunday, a future open as the wine dark sea. I drank wine in the same cafe with Russia last week at midnight, talking about meters, blank verse, Alexandrines and Almursal, though she was keen to go outside and smoke in the insidious slat winter rain. Have you heard from Lamis? I haven't seen her in a month. She didn't answer an email. Her nephew, said Russia, died in prison. He was tortured the first of those five children. I'll meet Ismail in Beirut with Naima. In Beirut, no one arrests the daughters or the nephews of the neighbors these days. So she can bitch and moan about the neighbors and how her students can't translate a sayab, nothing but Iraq. The rain is falling on all the suburbs where it lives in exile and Lamis isn't answering the phone. These are from a sequence called Names, which is not entirely unrelated, uh, written a couple of years earlier, and I'll read some of these. Uh. Mm. A giant poplar shades the summer square, breakfast shift done, Reem smooths her kinky mass of auburn curls, walks outside, her leaf print dress green shadow on post-millennial bright air. It's almost noon. I smell of sweat. I smell, despite bain moussin and deodorant, crumpled and aging, while recognizant of luck to be today perennial appreciating trees. The sky is clear as this in Gaza and Guantanamo, about which I know just enough to mourn yesterday's dead. The elegies get worn away. Attrition crumbles them into chasm or quicklime of a turning year. Be mindful of names. They'll etch themselves like daily specials on the window glass in a delible medium. They'll pass transformed, erased, a cloud the wind dissolves above the ruckus of the under twelves on the slide, the toddlers on the grass, the ragged skinny guy taking a piss in the bushes, a matron tanning her calves on a bench, skirt tucked around her knees. A sparrow lands in the japonica as if it were a signal all at once, masked pigeons rush up from adjacent trees, wing beats intrusive and symphonic. A near total silence is the clear response. Four 
firelit mirrors lining the Corsican restaurant's wall reflected divergencies, Palestinian, Syrian, Lebanese, expat Russian, expat Jewish American. A new war had begun that afternoon. The shrinking world shrieked its emergencies well beyond our capabilities, if not to understand, to intervene. Though Murad, who practices medicine, has made of intervention a career. Khaled spent decades studying history in the jaws, shall we say, of an emergency. Start another bottle of rough-tongued wine, that sanguine glitter in the midnight mirror. Edinburgh Airport seems provincial when you're headed back to Charles de Gaulle Roissy in dusty sunlight of a mid-July midday. I had an hour, but there was Hind, we'd been at the same conference all weekend, who had three connections, Heathrow, Cairo, Beirut, where the runways had been bombed to Damascus. With airport Starbucks, we brainstormed the thesis in progress she'll have to write in English if she's going to publish it lesbian writers from the Arab world. Boarding call. I don't know if she got home. I emailed her. I haven't heard from her. The war had started five days earlier. Nora is writing about women also, women and war. She sends an email from Mosul. The books arrived and they are beautiful. I know, of course, the work of Fadwa Tukan, but since the invasion and the occupation, it is, it is hard to find books, even in Arabic. Attached is the synopsis of my postdoc proposal and the draft of a translation. I cannot visit my old teacher in Baghdad. Because I am Sunni and from Mosul, I would be immediately slain. Through the cracked prism of Al-Andalus, we, wit we witness mourning what we never had. The war goes on and on and on and on. And the last one. The names have been changed. Nobody's sister will be gunned down because her brother shook hands with one politician or another, or because a well-meaning woman activist kissed her father on both cheeks the way we do here, thinking we're all Mediterranean after all. Nobody's J-1 visa will be, rever will be revoked because of the conference she went to in Caracas, or worse, Tehran. We have an almost fiction with mnemonic cues which could be proper names or dates. Sipping another empire's bitter tonic, an inadvertent exile contemplates Harvard Square's nightlights on Ramadan. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Audre, Audre Lorde once said, "Keep if there's energy, keep it for the end. And uh, again, <laughs> Shukran, gracias. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, well, um, okay. Uh, completely, a uh, completely different tone. I'm going to read two hazels, which are great fun to write, as Suzanne Gardner knows, um, and which the wonderful and uh, too much, much, much too young deceased Kashmiri American poet Aga Shahid Ali uh, made popular in in English in the quote real form with the um, with with a repeated word in the rhyme and sometimes they can go and and they have they had he he called an anthology that he Shahid that is uh, uh, that. Um, uh, that he edited of the called Ravishing Disunities because he said that the chazal can, uh, which is made up of couplets, can have a, within one poem a, cup, a, a couplet about love, a couplet about war, a couplet about the changing of the seasons, and, and uh, the, uh, it's the structure that holds the poem together rather than it having to be linear. Uh, and I'm going to read t 
two of them that are pretty different. Uh, one, one of them is called Chazal on half a line. Oh, oh, and the other thing is that the poet is supposed to put his or her name or some version thereof in the, le in the last couplet. So this, is, this one is called Chazal on half a line by Adrian Rich. In a familiar town, she waits for certain letters, working out the, conf the confusion and the hurt in letters. Whatever you didn't get, the job, the girl, rejections are inevitably curt in letters. This is a country with a post office where one can still make oneself heard in letters. Her one street over neighbors, Madame de Sévigné, who almost always had the last word in letters. Was the disaster pendant from a tongue one she might have been able to avert in letters? Still, acrimony, envy, lust, disdain are landmines the unconscious can insert in letters. Sometimes more rage clings to a page than she would claim. It's necessary to remain alert in letters. An estranged friend donated to a library three decades of her dishing out the dirt in letters. And words which resonate and turn within the mind can lie there, flattened and inert in letters. The tightest place precisely spoken celibate may inadvertently shrug off her shirt in letters. Ex-lovers who won't lie down naked again still permit themselves to flirt in letters. What does Anonymous compose unsigned at night after she draws the curtain? Letters. <laughs> And, uh, and this one, uh, a bit more recent, was actually written in Konya, where Rumi lived and did most of his writing. And it was written at a, at a conference that took place there on the work of Rumi that involved uh, poets and scholars from the United States, from Iran, from Turkey, obviously, since that's where Konya is, uh, from, uh, from Syria, from Mexico, from Germany, uh, and fr from Afghanistan. And there was a very young woman from Afghanistan whose name was Farkanda, who t we, we were talking about the Hazal in Rumi. And she said, when I was a little girl, uh, four or five years old, uh, my father and my uncles and their f male friends ought, would sit in a room all night reciting Hazals out loud, drinking tea and smoking and, and uh, 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 clapping when, uh, uh, when they particularly appreciated a poem. Uh, and I, as a small child and a small female child, that that wasn't allowed in the room, uh, but I would sit outside the door and uh, memorize as much as I possibly could of the poems that I was hearing. Uh, so this chazal is dedicated to Farkonda. Laughter, music, voices singing verses can be heard outside the door. The little girl is memorizing every word outside the door. Light in the stairwell, seen through the Judas hole. Is that the visitor you longed for or you feared outside the door? Long hours in lamplight, practicing his scales in counterpoint to solfage of a bird outside the door. The diplomat entering the leader's office forgets the copt, the communist, the Kurd outside the door. Praise for the leader, loyalty till death. Another imprecation is whispered outside the door. The first love left, the second packs her bags. Are those the nervous footsteps of the third outside the door? Self is a mirror, poster color bright, but notice how the colors become blurred outside the door. The revolutionary's nameless laundress wonders what happens to a dream deferred outside the door. <laughs> and uh, uh, a very 
very different topic. This is a poem called Headaches, <laughs> and some of us get them. <laughs> Wine again, the downside of any evening's bright exchanges, scribbled with retribution, stark awake, a tick throbs in the left temple's sight of bombardment. Tortured syntax, thorned thoughts, vocabulary like a forest littered with unexploded cluster bombs, no exit except explosion ripping the branches. Stacks of shadowed books on the bedside table wall a jar of tiger bomb. You grope for its glass netsuke hexagon. Tick stabs, dull pain, supersedes voices. Stills obsessive, one-sided conversations. Turn from mouths you never will kiss, a neck your fingers will not trace. 53, the bus to Maton. Uh, Mavis lived in, uh, was, was, had been living in Paris, but then lived in, in a rented uh, cottage in the south of France for many years, and starting in, in 1953 when she was in her late 20s. <clears throat> her own displacement seemed easy in comparison. She had been a reporter. She would be a novelist. And her country, she'd write about it, seemed provincial. The war was over. Near the roadside, sheaves were tied. Gossip behind her, a new dialect. She listened. Beyond sprawled olive terraces, Unlike the farms of home whose outbuildings sh circled like a garrison, her notebook's lined page waited to be kissed. The noon heat condensed into a mortal chill up her spine. A blondish man with rolled up sleeves had pushed the bus window open. Sunlight glistened on the long number tattooed on one of his sunburned arms. And, um, okay. Um, actually, the, this, this poem could follow from that one as well, many poems. Um, uh, uh, th uh, this is an this is a glossa, which um, uh, another one of those forms that we get. This one we get from 16th, 17th century Spain, in which a poet takes four lines from somebody else's poem and uh, uh, elaborates four stanzas, each one of which um, ends with uh, one of those lines. And this one. In this poem, in this poem, the, the poem that is glossed, is, uh, is or glossed, uh, is was my translation of a poem by the French poet Emmanuel Moses, and those four lines are, the rampart, the rampart behind the leprosarium, that also is Jerusalem, blue brooks cross the fields, light silver leaves a stocky tree. And here is the gloss, which uh, starts in Paris again and then goes other places. Sunday noon haze on the fruit stalls of Belleville, a clochard's clothesline under the Pont des Arts, the last Alsatian deli in the Rue de Tortille, the second kosher couscous in the Rue saint maur the northern line at midnight back from Stockwell via Charing Cross since no one, not even a cab, had come, the black mountains lurching past a drunken car, a mail van threading the Col de Vence in lunar dawn when the town's enceinte is a columbarium, the rampart behind the leprosarium. An equinoctial dusk wrapping the Square du Temple, a hangnail moon glimpsed through light rain on the Pont Sully, the 96 bus trapped by parked motorcycles outside the Royal Turin, honking while truck fumes mount, and the bus driver shouts at the motor what he thinks of them, somewhat distracting his stalled passengers. The cyclists are pertinently not there. 
the glass of water the waiter brings to him. That also is Jerusalem. Methods of crossing borders are diverse. Sixty years passed and trains are innocent again. Cream-colored cattle kneel, a lone horse in a barnyard cocks a gray ear to the wind. The sibilance of riverbanks, the terse monosyllables a billboard holds aloft above the tracks, a jet trail's spent calligraphy. Their messages disperse in the breached air, whistling as it yields. Blue brooks cross the fields. In a vision of the perfected past, a cindered path's circumference of vines measures the play of words and breath at last conjoined in a few salvageable lines. All of the hour's trajectory not lost in burnt out synapses of memory. Yet some insight bestowed on aliens inscribes the vineyard on a palimpsest of city, valley, hills, a different city, light silver leaves, a stocky tree. And just for fun, and I hope it, it's f fun to you too, I'm going to read a, a rather different poem that is the same form, but a completely completely different text. In this case, the poem that was glosed uh, was by the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, and in the, trans in the English translation done by Judith Hempschmeyer. And, uh, and the speaker of the poem is someone like Akhmatova, whom in the Stalinist years was was forbidden to publish her work, and so she would write she would write poems, and then she and a friend who was very often not always but quite often a young widow named Lydia Chupovskaya, who later wrote a memoir about this, they'd read the poem, they'd read it over and over and over again, they would both memorize it, and then they would burn it in the ashtray, uh, so it only existed in their minds. And the four lines from Akhmatova's poems poem are. And I grew up in patterned tranquility in the cool nursery of the new century. And the voice of man was not dear to me, but the voice of, wi of the wind I could understand. <clears throat> a sibilant wind presaged a latish spring. Bare birches leaned and whispered over the gravel path. Only the river ever left. Still, someone would bring back a new sailor midi to wear in the photograph of the four of us. Sit still, stop fidgeting. Like the still leafless trees with their facility for lyric prologue and its gossipy aftermath, I like to make up stories. I like to sing. I was encouraged to cultivate that ability, and I grew up in patterned tranquility. In the single room, with a greasy stain like a scar from the gas fire's fumes, when any guest might be a threat, and any threat was a guest from the past or the future. At any hour of the night, I would put the tea things out, though there were scrap leaves of tea, but no sugar, or a lump or two of sugar, but no tea. Two matches, a hoarded cigarette, my day's page ashed on its beer in a bedsitter. No godmother had presaged such white nights to me in the cool nursery of the young century. The human voice distorted itself in speeches, a rhetoric that locked locks and ticked off losses. Our words were bare as that stand of winter birches while poetasters sugared the party boss's edicts, the only sugar they could purchase, with servile metaphor and simile. The effects were mortal, however complex the causes. When they beat their child beyond this thin wall, his screeches, wails, and pleas were the gibberish of history, and the voice of man was not dear to me. Men and women, I mean, those high-pitched voices, how I wanted them to shut up, 
They sound too much like me, little machines for evading choices, little animals selling their minds for touch. The young widow's voice is just hers as she memorizes the words we read and burn, nights when we read and burn with the words unsaid, hers and mine, as we watch and are watched, and the river reflects what spies. Is the winter trees rustling a code to the winter land? But the voice of the wind, I could understand. And I will read one last poem. Um, which is another, another one of those pontoons written not too terribly long ago, like a year and a half. Um, and um, it's dedicated to a good friend, uh, Fadwa Suleiman, uh, who is a Syrian political exile living in France. Uh, in Syria, she was a fairly well, she's about 43, 44. In Syria, she was a well-known actress in theater, film, even television series. Um, and then she gave up her career to join the revolution in 2011, you know, cut off her beautiful long hair, wrapped a kefi around her head, and made speeches. Uh, as, uh, I, I first, in fact, saw her before I ever met her on a YouTube making a speech to the young insurgents in humps standing in front of the clock tower and saying, one, one, the, Syri the Syrian people are one, and everyone was cheering. And it seemed as if uh, things might be better the next day, and they weren't. Uh, and she had to leave because her life was in danger. Um, and we then, in Paris, where we met, became friends, were walking across the across a bridge one day, across the river, and I said something to her in my bad Arabic, and uh, just then we saw a man who both of us recognized, I because I'd seen him at political meetings, and he because she had, she Fadwa had last seen him uh, also addressing the crowd in front of the clock tower in Humps when it was, when things seemed possible, so. <clears throat> said the old woman, who barely spoke the language, freedom is a dream, and we don't know whose, said the insurgent who was now in exile. When I began to write the story, I started bleeding. Freedom is a dream, and we don't know whose. That man I last saw, speaking in front of the clock tower when I began to write the story, I started bleeding five years after I knew I'd have no more children. That man I last saw speaking in front of the clock tower turned an anonymous corner and disappeared. Five years after I knew I'd have no more children, my oldest son was called up for the army, turned an anonymous corner and disappeared. My nephew, my best friend, my second sister, whose oldest son was called up for the army, are looking for work now in other countries. Her nephew, his best friend, his younger sister, a doctor, an actress, an engineer, are looking for work now in other countries, stumbling, disillusioned in a new language. A doctor, an actress, an engineer wrestle with the rudiments of grammar, disillusioned, stumbling in a new language, hating their luck and knowing they are lucky. Wrestling with the rudiments of grammar, the old woman who barely speaks the language hated her luck. I know that I am lucky, said the insurgent, who is now in exile. Thank you very much. <laughs>